Okay, we have people here from Huntsville, Utah, Payette, Idaho, Southern Utah. Fantastic. In the past, we have had people from lots of different places. And we're seeing a few more people starting to see these on uh, YouTube. So that's fun. Hopefully it's helping people have the best garden of their life. I hope that that's the, that's the fact anyway. So that'll be great. And I am from Clover Valley, Nevada. Me and my wife live here in northern Nevada in the Humboldt Mountains. And we're going to kick this off tonight. This is our free Q&A tonight. And this picture right here is the cover of my book that's coming out in April. So that is pretty exciting. We're waiting for a few more blurbs to get back from smart people. And so that'll be good. Uh, I have not had any serious criticism on my book yet from the people who have had read it, which is fantastic. Uh, because I've had some brilliant people read it. I have had some people being very surprised uh, because they said that there are new concepts that they've never thought about. So that is good. I'm glad I am. I'm not just redoing what has already been done a hundred times. I'm excited that there are some new concepts being introduced to the discussion in the world. So here are the nine ways that I help people grow food. I like to go through this every week so that people who find this on YouTube can um, find me so I can help them uh, give, you know, have the best garden of your life if you're struggling. I have a YouTube channel. I do a free Q&A every Thursday night. That's tonight, right now. I have Patreon. You can sign up $8 a month and you have access to all of my videos on how to have the best garden of your life. I'm a soil laboratory. I can help you know which organisms are actively creating food for your plants. I have a 17-week boot camp for people who want to learn about ecology and how to grow food in an ecological friendly way and how to make money farming in a world where fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides and fuel are extremely expensive because we don't use very many of those things. If you have a big farm, you will be using some fuel to drive a tractor, but you can get rid of the other inputs completely and, and have excellent food production. And then I have a three-day boot camp, uh, which is for families to come to my farm, my garden, my greenhouse, and I teach you everything I can in three days. So when you come to that, come with questions and get ready to get your hands dirty because we are going to be working in the garden. I'm available for consulting for your farm so that you can produce the best food in the world. My book is um, being reviewed. And it comes out next month. So that's uh, a highlight of my life because I've been wanting to uh, publish a gardening book, write it and publish it ever since I was a child. And now I'm turning 50 this year. And so we have 50 years of my experience in that book. So uh, that's uh, I'm super thrilled about that, being able to share that. And if you're not getting my newsletter or, or emails from me, I don't know if it's a newsletter or not. I call it that. If you're not getting an email from me, go to www.georgicrevolution.com, which is my website, and sign up on the front page. Just scroll down a little bit. And it'll say sign up. Give me your email and you will be on the list to get my newsletter. I sent a newsletter out this week talking about my 17-week program, and I had fun pictures of my students from last year. So if you did not get that email, you are not signed up. Here, this picture right here is, these are my teachers, my mentors, my heroes. I have more teachers, mentors, and heroes than are on this list, but if they made it on this list, they had something very important that contributed to the things that I teach. So uh, take a screenshot of this if you want to learn more about ecological agriculture. Tonight's subject is, should trees be cut down to conserve water in drought years? So there's people who... I've heard in the last year, because of the extended drought in the West, 
hopefully the heavy snowfall and rain this winter will stop the drought, but it has been such a bad drought that it may not. Uh, so we will see. Um, talk to me in 14 months, and then we can see if this um, ended the drought or not. But there are people who have claimed and said and taught that we should remove grass and lawns from people's yards because it takes too much water. We should remove trees so that it will create uh, more water because the trees are drinking it all up, is what people say. <laughs> so my son Ezekiel has been studying this a lot. He's on tonight. We're going to talk about this quite a bit in a few minutes. Uh, but there are some things to think about here. I'm going to move from this slide pretty quick. So you may want to take a picture of this with your uh, cell phone or whatever so that we can look at these later on in our discussion. But let's just go through them really quick. <clears throat> Do we understand what makes a drought? And it's actually more than, well, it doesn't train. <clears throat> That's the kindergarten answer. And the kindergartners who would answer that way don't know. Although there are probably some kindergartners who would get the right answer for sure. So what actually makes it rain? What makes grass grow? What makes hot air rise? And, and what, what does that have to do with it? What pushes clouds away? I'll give you a hint. Hot air rising pushes clouds away. What kind of ground gets hot? And why does that matter? Well, because it makes the hot air rise if the ground is hot. And then that pushes the clouds away and that causes a drought. Is zeroscaping a good thing or a bad thing? There's different kinds of zeroscaping. There's zeroscaping with no plants. And then there's zeroscaping with all kinds of plants. Zeroscaping is, is landscaping with plants that um, use no water or no plants that obviously don't drink water. And then what makes a soil sponge? And I have a typo there, sorry. That's supposed to be soil, not soy. S-O-I spells something that I didn't try to write. What makes a soil sponge? A soil sponge would be soil that infiltrates water. It soaks it up. It soaks up water like a sponge. So if you get a good soaking rainstorm, it stays in the soil. And then if it doesn't rain for three months, your plants are still fine because you have a sponge of soil. All right, I'm moving on to the next slide here. I got this picture from the Alan Savory website. Um, Alan Savory is one of the uh, smartest ecologists alive today. <clears throat> and he has a famous TED Talk. You could, If you like to watch TED Talks, you could look up Alan Savory TED Talk. Say that into Google. It'll come right up. Watch his TED Talk. We teach um, his principles and a lot of others to get these kinds of results. This is the same piece of land. 1974, it was desertified. It was degraded because cattle overgrazed it. And here's the picture in 2013 where the trees have grown back. The grassland is growing back. There is some bare dirt in here, but it is certainly not desertified like it was in 1974. And the tool that was used to bring it back was cattle. With proper and educated grazing management. So what makes grass grow? Well, what eats the grass? Herbivores eat grass. So an animal that eats grass is an herbivore or, or plants is an herbivore. And they have a symbiotic relationship. Look at the 1974 picture real quick. The quickest way to create a desert is to remove all grazers from the land. And it will desertify faster than any other known um, thing in, in, in our world. Um, the next quickest way to desertify it is probably modern farming where we're doing lots of tillage, but we don't really think of that as desertification. But, you know, the heavy plowing will can certainly desertify. Um, another way to desertify land pretty quickly is to overgraze it so the plants die because they eat, eat, get eaten down too much, and they can't recover. But the only thing we've heard about in the media, in our modern world, 
is the idea that overgrazing, meaning livestock, are the enemy. And what we have actually found when we used the science to find the best answer, instead of using science to prove what we already thought, what we find is that cattle are the very best tool to keep grasslands green and beautiful in spite of the amount of rainfall. Um, so we are going to open this up for questions now. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we are going to have a conversation about things that are going on in government and, and in that kind of thing. Me and Zeke are going to talk about it. Other people, you are welcome to join this conversation. And um, and then, yeah, we just want to talk about this a little bit, talk about some of these principles. I just want to remind you, Spring Boot Camp is coming up April 27, 28, 29. Get signed up. I still have room for a couple of people. 17-week course is, is coming up soon, May through September. And I have three people signed up. I can take five people this year. And I've got three people signed up and one person thinking seriously about it. So if you want to do this course, you need to contact me right away so you can get in. Because once it fills up, it's filled up. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. And I'm going to um, unmute Ezekiel here. Or you can unmute yourself or whatever. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Done. I don't know. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so let's just talk for a minute, Ezekiel. You had an inter interesting experience this week, in the last couple of weeks. And I was talking to you on the phone last night, and you said that in the city where you live, that they were having a, a city council meeting. Is that what it was? It was, and I can give some details about that. Um, so we were... It was for my wife's school. She's in a she's in a class right now where we needed to attend a city council meeting. So we were looking up what the city council meeting was, what was on the agenda, that kind of stuff. And the thing that was on the agenda was a proposal about Arbor Day. And there was significant controversy about it because there were a lot of people who were very worried that putting in more uh, putting in more trees or encouraging more trees and um, there was another project for resodding an area uh, that had gone to to sand. They they were going to come in and put grass down that was a it was a dry land grass. They weren't planning on doing very much irrigating for it. It would only need irrigation for a couple months, then it would take root and turn it back into grassland. Um, and those were kind of their goals and stuff. And it, actually, they'd gotten large donations from the community for this, so it wasn't even a thing where they were going to like raise taxes. It's just do we want to spend our money on this and the controversy was there were people who felt like that would damage the water situation in iron county utah because they're very uh, worried about this um which is fair um the, the i went there like prepared to really give a speech luckily the city council agreed with me and not with the controversial people on Facebook. And they ended up uh, setting up that Arbor Day is going to be a thing and uh, setting some tentative goals that they'll have more meetings about in the future um, about how many trees they want to get. Um, and it was overall a very positive experience. But the, the fact that there were people in the community that didn't want more trees, that wanted less vegetation, showed kind of a fundamental misunderstanding of how the water cycle works in the context of our environment. It's not helped when the state water plan also suggests get tearing out sod and such. Um, I mean, I can understand where they're coming from because people watering their lawns when it's to drought can feel uh, insensitive to the situation, I suppose. But when we really try and understand the whole water cycle, and especially when people are trying to use um, forms of vegetation that add to the water cycle rather than, you know, just taking more than their fair share, it's actually, I, I think, a better thing to have as much vegetation as we can. And I, I as much as some of my friends are, you know, 
not so friendly towards government institutions. I love to see them doing good things and helping the community come together to guard and protect a resource that affects all of us, like water. So that, that's kind of my summary of, of the events. Okay, thank you. So, you know, it is interesting because um, I've heard, like, people in northern Utah, there was an article, I don't know when it was, it was maybe three months ago, um, and sometime this winter anyway, and they were talking about the watersheds in the Wasatch Mountains and how we need to fill up the Great Salt Lake and, uh, you know, and on other places because the water levels are going down. So what do we do? If we removed the trees from the mountains, then the trees would stop drinking all the water and then the water would run down. So I just have a question for, and anybody can answer and put in your two cents. I'm obviously very opinionated about this because I've been studying this for, I don't know, all my life maybe. And I've really focused on it in the last couple of years. But the question is, if if you don't have enough water flowing in a river, will it increase or decrease the amount of water if you cut down the trees along the river? So somebody answer. <laughs> Nobody dares because if you don't agree with me, I'm gonna jump on you, <laughs> attack you. <laughs> I'm not really, but I, I mean, I have two cents on this. It's uh, you, the water cycle is a cycle. And like many cycles, people have a bad habit of isolating the one part we want and really trying to get that part to over produce and be nice and big and massive. And often they ignore the rest of the cycle, all the parts that build up to that and all the parts that come after. Uh, it's it's part of the problem and and so like if your goal is to have the highest levels in your lakes and such you can hit that goal and it'll look really good in the short term because look how high our lakes are but if you've sacrificed the rest of the cycle for that one part you might you know it's not going to be a long-term solution and you're either going to run into the same problems you were having, you're just passing it on to your children or whoever's in charge next year, or you're going to have unintended side, uh, side effects of what you did that are going to be new problems that are now going to be worse. And so it's very important when we're dealing with natural systems that we understand how the natural system works before we decide to play God. Okay, yeah, um, you're totally right. As we a lot of times we don't see the whole picture. Uh, we see one part of the picture, and we think that'll say, solve the problem. So it's fantastic, Ezekiel. So let's just go back. Let's ask a question. And if if you did take a picture of those questions I had on the slide, uh, that's what I'm going to talk about right now for a second. But so what makes a drought? And I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make this simple, and anybody can answer this. Okay. So this is a multiple choice question. What makes a drought? Uh, does the lack of rain make a drought? Or does bare ground make a drought? Anybody at all? Some of you on here, I know you know the answer. I know the answer to this question, but I want to kind of answer it with something I watched on a documentary today. Uh, I was talking about rainforests, and um, and in the documentary, they were discussing that the loss of the rainforest had everything to do with the loss of diversity in the forests themselves. Certain trees were being cut down, and they it wasn't lack of rain. The rainforest didn't grow because there was plenty of rain. The rainforest thrived because there was a diversity of plants growing. Um, and by losing that diversity of plants, they were losing the rainforests. They were losing the rain. They were losing the water. It was, it was essentially the bare earth that caused the drought, not the lack of rain. Okay, that, that's exactly what I think. 
and and we can and it's not just what I think. This is what good science shows when we have studied all the different ecosystems around the earth. When you have vast areas, we can measure it in acres or square miles or whatever you want. When you have vast areas of bare ground, that ground will heat up because the sun hits it. The sun reflects off of it. And you would just take a thermometer. You know those cool, awesome thermometers they have nowadays? They're like a pistol. You can hold it in your hand and you can shoot the laser at something and, and it reads the thermometer. This summer, go out there and start taking readings on your lawn where there's in your garden where there's plants and then go to your like somewhere like the road or a gravel or walk into a yard that's been zero scaped with gravel and look at the difference in the temperatures you will find a difference where the ground is covered with vegetation and it doesn't really matter what kind but if you can't see the dirt and the soil and all there is is vegetation you have lower temperatures so when that hot air from all the bare ground rises into the sky, it pushes the clouds away. And the clouds will keep following the jet stream until they get to a different um, area, or they simply get so heavy that they can't hold the water anymore and then they dump. And when that happens, it creates a flood. So that's an interesting, an interesting, pretty neat thing that happens. Um, you know, and so what makes it rain? Does bare ground make it rain or does bare ground cause a drought? Well, like we just said, the bare ground is the thing that is is causing the drought. And there's a lot of bare ground nowadays all around the world for various reason, reasons. And most of the reasons are because of uh, poor management from humans. We're not managing the land very good. Um, anyway, let's talk about xeroscaping. There, I, last summer, when my students were here for my 17-week class, one of them got a text from one of the friends and said that somebody in northern Utah was um, trying to, and I don't know who it was, but somebody, they were trying to promote the idea of xeroscaping, tear out all your lawns, take out all your trees, all your bushes around your house, and just put in really cool rocks and, and gravel. You won't have to mow your lawn. You'll save money on your water bill. And they were promoting all these benefits. And, and uh, no, I'm not here to argue the benefits. It's probably true. You wouldn't spend as much on irrigating. You wouldn't be using as much water. But what have you done to the ecological cycle of, of the, the mineral cycle? Have you, have, have you messed with that? Uh, what about the water cycle? Certainly messed with that. Uh, what about the the energy flow cycle? The sun coming down. Are you collecting and getting any benef benefit from the photons? Or are they just heating things up? So, you know, we, we need to be thinking this stuff through when we make decisions. And we need to do it in an educated way that actually benefits the long term and not just this year. Because this year it might be a good idea to make a decision, but you need the long term. And in my book that's coming out, um, chapter six is all about that. How to uh, figure out if a one decision you're going to make, how is that going to impact the long term? How is it going to impact your money that you're making? How does it impact your everything about your life? So... Um, anyway, uh, but what are scientists supposed to do? Um, you know, a lot of times we know and we understand, you know, how they, all of these things interact, but what is the, and I don't have, this is a real question. This is my question for you. So tonight we're turning this around because I don't have an answer. I mean, I have ideas, but <laughs> I don't have a good answer that I'm solid on, how do scientists use the information they have to actually fix the community when the scientists are a few hundred people in, a, in a, who understand this in an entire world? And even among us, we have different goals and different focuses. Even if we all agree, let's say there's 500 of us who all agree, but we have different focuses. Some of us are focused on building a business. Some are focused on 
getting a grant. Some are focused on just, you know, publishing something and that's taking three months. And we, we all have these focuses of life. What are we supposed to do? How do we get the information to the world? And how do we, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of hows. There's probably 10 things. But what are so scientists supposed to do in general to understand this stuff? Any any answers to this? I ha I have some thoughts on this. <clears throat> so I just um I just graduated with my degree in psychology, and one of the last classes I took, uh, we we actually had a a class on how to measure, uh, how to do testing, psychological testing on people, and one of the facts that that came out in in our discussion about how to test people, how to determine where someone is uh, in social sciences with their, their mental capacity, thought processes, um, was that the research that's happening on all, uh, all, all scientific areas, this is across the board, the research that is happening in labs and at universities is, um, is implemented in teaching in about 10 years from when the research is done. And it's widely accepted by the civilization 20 years out. You're looking at two decades before the research that's happening today is implemented anywhere in society. So that means that the information that people are making decisions on today is a couple of decades old. And, and this is information that informs public policy. It's information that, uh, that involves um, your your health and well-being pharmaceutical information uh it's the stuff that's being taught at the schools um and and i think i think in order for us to fully implement any kind of research we have to first of all we have to have an open mind about what people are discovering you have to recognize that research is not 100 percent proof in fact i i, I talk regularly uh, with my husband about this because it frustrates me uh people will share um they'll share a a, a research uh thing that came out and it's uh, it's kind of clickbait uh i don't even know i can just make one up uh, uh they're gonna prove that someone can lose weight by taking this this magic pill that somebody made um and it's proven to be you know 100 percent effective to make you skinny in two weeks whatever <laughs> and people get on it and it's wonderful there's all kinds of sales and then they find out six months later that it, it isn't actually as effective as they said it was. That's a real thing. Uh, in science, it's called the replication crisis. Up to 80% of all research being done cannot be replicated with the same parameters with which the original test was done. That means there's not, it's hard to have faith in a lot of the science. So, um, you see people, uh, William, you fall into this into this uh, path. A lot of the people in the regenerative ag movement fall into this path where instead of choosing a lot of the peer-reviewed research studies that are not able to be replicated or have a very small parameter uh, of viability or, or efficacy, they're, they're following case studies instead. They're looking at people who are saying, look, I've been following a path of good land management for 30 years now, and I can show you a sequence of improvement in my soil, on my land for the last three decades. And, and this, is a, this is a huge uh, grassroots, pun intended, movement where people are looking at what is being done in various places around the world, and they're following suit. And, and the cool thing about it, I, I, I actually like to think of it as, this is scientific. It's not petri dish science, but this is very much empirical science. These are people who are saying, okay, this is what uh, Alejandro is doing down in Mexico and it's working. I'm going to look at what's working for him. I'm going to try it here in Nevada. So Jared is here in Nevada and he's using, he's using similar methods and he's tweaking it for what he needs on his land. So this is, this is what a case study looks like. We take the research that is available to us, we implement it in our area and we adjust 
to improve the quality of soil. You have your goal in mind and you, you work to reach that goal. I think that can happen on any level. I just think that we have, we have people who get mired in, um, in scientific research with almost a uh, religious intensity instead of embracing scientific inquiry um, as, a, as a methodology for understanding how we interact well with the world. And uh, I think if we can discard the, um, that intensity that makes us biased and embrace the method instead, we're gonna try something, we're gonna implement it, we're gonna measure it, we're gonna see how it works, we're going to improve it if we need to in a way that is, um, that is helping our soil. I, I think that's how we implement it. That way you have people who are in a city situation and instead of that false dichotomy that you're either growing food or you're wasting water on a lawn, you look at it and say, okay, what's gonna be better for the entire environment? Is it gonna be, is it gonna be a water, um, a high water usage lawn? Or am I just gonna maybe see what grows naturally and then mow my weeds? I remember my mom saying years ago, she lived in San Jose, California. And she said the best lawn she ever had was the one she didn't water and she just mowed the weeds. It was great, <laughs> but she still had her green lawn. <laughs> anyway, I, that was long and rambling, but I think, I think that the way people implement the science, uh, they implement the ideas is by taking even just one thing at a time and, and implementing it in their space in the way that they can and making gradual improvements. But where do they even start though? How, how does somebody know where to start? Because most people, let's just say a person living in a town or a city and they're not a big farmer, they just, they go to Home Depot or to Lowe's or to the Walmart garden center. They walk in there and they are bombarded and overwhelmed with maybe maybe 2,000 products on the shelves. And they're just like, wow. And that's that's it. It's, it's wow. And if you're going past the fertilizer section, that stuff stinks. And so they're like, man, I'm getting out of here. And then they ask somebody working there. And the person working there has been trained to sell. Sell, sell, sell. They don't actually know anything about ecology for sure. I mean, maybe somebody does, but like one out of a million people working at one of those places would have the first clue about ecology because we are illiterate when it comes to ecology in this world. That's why I can confidently say a, a mean statement about the poor people trying to earn a living. But uh, what is the normal person supposed to do? Because as a scientist, I am begging people to come to my classes. I'm begging people to read my book. Of course, I got to get it printed first, but I'm begging people for all this stuff, right? So what do we actually, how do we reach a tipping point? Let me just, let me tell you the good news. There are millions of acres that are doing it the right way right now, but it's still only 3%. I think there's there's around between 32 and 38 thousand million 30 excuse me between 32 and 38 million acres right now in, in the world that are being farmed in a very healthy way. Dr. Alan Williams just told me that a few weeks ago. I was on a Zoom call with him, and uh, and th but that's only three percent, so it's not very much. So there's a lot of work to do. And we need to do, you know, we need to keep going. So, but it's pretty nice to hear those big numbers of millions of people. Ezekiel had his hand raised. I was going to call on him right now, and then he got kicked off. So he'll have to log back in. Or he got mad and said, I'm out of here. <laughs> oh, dear. Here he's getting back on. Okay, Ezekiel, you had your hand up. Yes. Did you accidentally kick me out? No, I didn't try to. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No. Um. So, uh, just jumping off of what you and Vernie said, 
um, you both raise some very interesting points, and I think they highlight an issue in the agricultural community as a whole. Since the 1940s, really in the 1950s, the agricultural movement has often been the great justification of all science. Starting in the 80s, healthcare got an equal justification for that, but it was food first. It's it because we had a lot of infrastructure built to extract uh, nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus to make fertilizer. But it wasn't originally made to make fertilizer. It was originally made to make weapons. And so the scientists who are the only people who can make this stuff wanted justification to keep their businesses in order. And I'm not going to get into the whole history of that, but that set a precedent for this belief that if farmers aren't at the cutting edge of technology, they are not doing their jobs well. And that's not true. Even on a basic level, that's not true. We should be at the cutting edge of technology, but it does not define the success of the business because farms are businesses. Therefore, their profitability defines their success. And more farmers need to keep that in mind. That's the main reason to follow the case studies and do what other people are doing effectively. I, for instance, my day job is in information technology. And we don't read all the new science to figure out our next business thing. We don't read about, you know, how the, I mean, I do, because I think it's interesting, but as a business, we don't focus on, oh, they're making these quantum computers in South Korea that can move 8,000 8, terabytes per second. It's cool, but it's not relevant to the business because it's not something we do. Therefore, I think that the, that a lot more farmers need to focus on effective business management, making sure that their profits are match a actual realistic profit margin. And I think that's the single biggest argument behind the new system is reducing your inputs. Even though you might be yielding less per acre, your profit margin is so much bigger and those inputs are slowly collapsing with, between COVID and the wars in Asia that are going on and the war in Europe right now. Our inputs are slowly falling apart. Uh, the ability of people to produce, ship, manufacture, and administer those inputs are breaking. So more farmers need to be more focused on actual economics and making sure their business is viable rather than being concerned with what the new te te like scientific thing is. Even though the new science agrees with this, the obsession with making sure everything you've done has been perfectly peer-reviewed and that we understand all, all of the processes going into it, not that we understand that it works, but that we understand how the enzymes interact, not important to the farm functioning. So that's the big reason that the case studies matter. And how that applies to the individual is when you're starting off your farm, you have to understand your farm needs to be profitable. Even if it's just a backyard thing for your family, if you're spending more money on your farm than you would be spending if you went to the grocery store, you're not doing it right. Not to say you should stop, but you need to improve your system. If you spend $1,000 a year on vegetables at the grocery store and you try and grow stuff and you find out you're spending $2,000 a year on your gardening, that's an expensive hobby and not effective agriculture. And so the same principle applies. We should be more concerned with our own economies and making sure that we are profitable, effective, than we should be about caring about you know, understanding the names of all the microbiota and making sure that everything everybody's ever claimed about fungus is exactly right. It's right enough to work and to save or make you money. Therefore, it's right enough to work with. And as more people do it, we're going to have more and more opportunities for actual peer-reviewed studies to, uh, to help us understand why it works. We already know it does. And later, the scientists will come along, tell us why, and we'll be able to refine the process. But waiting until the process is refined to start it is not how science progresses. Right. I think I agree with everything you said. If I don't, we'll fight about it later. <laughs> but no, I no. Thanks for your comment. That's really good. Okay. Um. So we, yeah, we have other people on here tonight, and they probably brought a question. 
So let's turn the time over to um, whoever else is on here. We've got Ron and um, Laurel and Hannah. If you guys want to unmute and ask a question, we can talk about it. If you would rather, you can type it into the chat and I'll read it and we can discuss these things. I've got a question, Mr. Lorel, up in Huntsville, okay. um, and this is about my garden. It's it's a different subject than what we're talking about here, and that is I'm you know I've got some stuff planted in there right now, but I'm working with my beds, and I'm having a hard time getting, you know I I my I'm working with my compost, but of course I'm it's slow so. I've got available uh, horse manure that's been rotated and turned and stuff. I've got a load of it and I check the temperature of it and it's down uh, under 70 degrees, but my greenhouse is really warm too. So can I, is that too hot from to use as my detritus to plant stuff in? Should I try and mix that with other stuff first? Um, and I know I should probably know the answer to this, but I don't. <laughs> All right, Laurel. I'm glad you're on tonight. Um, Laurel has been to two of my boot camps. It's good to hear your voice again. Um, it's awesome that you got your uh, greenhouse going. Uh, before I get into what you're talking about, I have a couple of questions to help clarify. So you have snow outside right now, right? Outside your greenhouse. Yes. Yes, I and do. So I have about three and a half feet of snow on the flat. Yeah, that's awesome. But the sun is shining through your greenhouse every day and warming up your soil so your soil is not freezing at night, right? Um, I don't think it is anymore. I know that I, I went out this morning and I have water out there and it wasn't frozen and we we got down pretty cold too. So, Yeah, that's fantastic. And your greenhouse is 30 feet wide by 96 feet long, right? That's correct. Okay, just making sure my memory is right. And you are, do you, how big are your plants in there right now? I've got some of them. They're probably um, about an inch high. Okay, Le like lettuce, spinach, kale? Yeah, yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. And, and those, are things, those are things that I started in the house, and I just I just planted them out there. Uh, just last week and just as a test trying to see if it's gonna they're gonna work and they have not frozen to death no they have not okay good you're gonna have a good salad here in, a, in another three weeks or four weeks or something that'll be awesome uh, so you have a truckload of horse manure that has begun began to decompose but it was not composted in the proper way that's what you're saying well, well what it was is it and i talked with the guy that i got it from he's been rotating it uh every every couple of weeks he he, he rotates it and he's been doing that for a while and he says that it doesn't get hot anymore so and so okay. i thought okay well i got a load of it and it's been i've had it piled up and so i keep checking the temperature and it doesn't heat up so okay i'm yeah. figuring that Okay, so how does it smell? It doesn't have a, it does not, I mean, it doesn't have a smell. So it's, it good. smells, it doesn't smell like poop. So, <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Okay. So it sounds like it's pretty good. Uh, and you just want to put what, an inch thick or five inches thick? What are you thinking? Well, well, what I've got is I have uh, some other stuff, it's horse manure and a wood sh wood shavings that it that gets warm and i thought about even mixing that but anyway i guess i'm looking for putting my cardboard down my detritus i wanted to see about this horse manure as my detritus and then i plant my plants in that yeah okay so here's my recommendation um so 
you only need the cardboard down if you have other plants underneath it that you don't want to come up. So like grass or weeds or whatever. If you have a nice clean, just dirt with no, no weeds, you won't need the cardboard. And then you can go ahead and put that in there. So make your bed, whatever size or shape you're making your bed, if they're long and skinny like mine, my greenhouse, you've seen them. They're about three feet wide and as long as the greenhouse. So go ahead and form a bed out of this. Don't plant in it yet. I want you to make your bed maybe six, four or six inches deep and then water it really good. And if there are weed seeds in that detritus, they will all sprout and come up pretty quick. So you're going to, at this time of year where it's still cold at night, but warm during the day, it might take two weeks for those weed seeds to sprout. So I want you to wait three weeks after you make the bed before you plant in it. Because if you plant your transplants in there, or, or if you're going to plant seeds, then you will have tons of weeds coming up and it's hard to get the, kill the weeds. But if you form your bed and then water it really well, and then let's say in two weeks, the whole thing is turning green with weeds, then you know that it was full of weed seed and you could go in there with a rake and you could just rake it really vigorously to kill all the weeds. And then don't water it for a day or two so that all those weeds dry up and then rake it again. And then, and then you get all those weeds killed, good. And then water it again and wait another week or two. So this may be like, if you think there's weed seeds in this, this could be a six week project before you plant in it. And that's just the way it is when you first start out, uh, you know, building a bed, if you don't know if there's weeds in it or not. So hopefully that's not discouraging if you were wanting to get planted like really quick, but if you wanted to, but it'll be easier in the long run. And it's still super early spring, so waiting, a, uh, doing a, a four to six week project is, I don't see that's a problem at all. Cause you know, in six weeks from now, you can still get a ton of good stuff planted out there. Um, okay. Did that, did that help? Uh, yes, uh, that did. Um, and I should, hopefully my other compost will be going ready by then too. So, okay. I, I have a second question for you. Okay, good. Um, I've been, you know, I've, I've planted my seeds, so I have all those started in my house, but I just saw, uh, those things where you can do, uh, uh, I think they called them dirt plugs where you can, uh, you don't have a, a, a container. And so I, I don't know if you've, I'm just curious your thoughts on something like that. Have you used those at all? Are those good? Yeah, so there's the little peat pellets you can use, and there's the well, no, the it's little, a, it's where you, it's a, you have it's a where you get a mold, a mold, yeah. and you actually, yeah, you make your own, yeah, yeah. You, you have the little machine, and and it compresses and it makes your own little uh, plugs, yeah. Essentially, you're making your own peat pellet, except you don't. They make those with a gigantic hydraulic, and you probably don't have that much power to make them so little, but. Yeah, I mean, I've never used them because it seems like too much work okay. for me. I mean, you know, you've been to my boot camp and I do the least amount of work yeah. possible. So, yeah, uh, you know, I, okay. I mean, they work. There's, I mean, I know market farmers who use those all the time and they swear by them and they love them and all that stuff. So, yeah, I mean, they work. If you want to get one and try it, go ahead. You know, they're they're kind of fun. Especially if you have a bunch of kids yeah. around, because you could make it a game, and then they do all the work. And <laughs> okay. Anyway. Okay. Well, very good, and yeah, I've and I just to plug for your class. It was amazing, and I'm real excited to now you know apply all these things and get this uh, going for the garden going in the in the hoop house, and so I'm excited about it. So. Thank you, Laurel. So that's thanks. awesome. Yeah. All right. That's all I've got. Thank you. Okay, great. Okay, Ron.
You guys got questions tonight? Um, she oh, wants to. Watch. Um, I don't think I had any questions right away. In um, answer to your discussion about the um, the desertification and and how to revive it, uh, the the land. Um, one comment that I heard uh, was um, the importance of following case studies at this point. And I agree with that. I think that sometimes when people get into standardized situations where they think that there's some standard way to do it all exactly, 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 that it, they can get into a trap of not being very viable because they're not adapting it to their own situation. So I thought that was interesting. So you had said earlier in the discussion that um, the way that the um, the land that you showed the pictures from 1970s to now or was um, bringing the cattle back um, was that in rotating their their eating habits or something like that or how did that yes work? yes it's called a uh, uh, holistic planned grazing is oh. what is the method they used holistic planned grazing. And we even had we had classes on that here at the ranch last year. I I did not teach them. Um, Jared Sorensen brought in some experts from the uh, the Outland Savory Institute, and they were here and they taught a class on it to a group of people. <laughs> and and Jared's been implementing those principles here for a long time, um, maybe a decade or so. But I mean, he he's been doing a lot of these principles for probably twenty years but mm -hmm. uh yeah and, and there's other there's a lot of different types of grazing that people do um some people will call it um uh, you know like just rotational grazing some people call it mob grazing some people call it adaptive grazing mm -hmm. and the the different people who have come up with these names tend to be um kind of um not combative but what's the right word <laughs> um they're, they're competitive thank you <laughs> people say it's rude to finish somebody's sentence but not when you're talking to me i want you to help me they are very competitive with what they're saying and what they're doing but it's interesting because they all have good points that we need to be studying and looking at you know if if a person just gets trained from one group then that's the box they're in, which may be a very effective box. But if you have been um, through 20 and you have now you have 20 boxes to draw from, you have a lot better education. So we want to go deep and wide in our educations, not just dabble in one or two different mm -hmm. things. So, yeah. Yeah, the, gra the grazing that they did was uh, it brought it back. And, and, you know, you don't look at the cattle to know when to move the cattle and some people do that well those cattle boy they could they could eat a lot more of that grass that's when you overgraze what you do is you have to be looking at the plants the plants tell you when to move the cattle the plants will tell you when to bring the cattle back so you have to learn a language called plant <laughs> <laughs> you know you have to be out there you have to be looking you have to be interacting you have to be watching the land will tell you things if you learn its language you, and, and you know so and you don't only learn plant you learn thousands of languages because there are thousands of species out there and you have to know what they're saying so but you don't sometimes i say that i say that in gen like in general like it but that's an ideology and people get overwhelmed and think well i could never learn all that so i'm not doing it <laughs> that's not what i mean you don't have to understand very much at all i mean if you knew three principles you could do amazing amount of things you know so <laughs> okay are there any more questions tonight questions thoughts politics <laughs> i hate politics but <laughs> well speaking of politics i think that um sometimes people approach these situations like Ezekiel was talking about with the with the city council meeting where 
they come with an ideology rather than with wanting to discuss the situation. And so that makes it more difficult to really come to a solution because somebody comes with an ideology and doesn't want to talk about it. They just want to tell you what they think and, and it's most important, you know? So I think that we need to keep that in mind for ourselves too, that we come ready to discuss things um, with other people rather than coming with our own, you know, with the plan that, you know, with an ideology that we think will m make the plan work. Or yeah, whatever. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the, Vernie's clapping. She's got her <laughs> clapping going on. I think she loved that. <laughs> So uh, we could, Verna, you could unmute if you had something to say, but just real quickly, what you just said is, is um, awesome because that's how Alan Savory made uh, his great scientific breakthroughs. I mean, he made like, he, he made a whole bunch of major breakthroughs and the way, the reason and the way that he made them is because as a young scientist, he made some really serious mistakes because he used science to prove what the scientific community already thought they knew. And, and that's how science is done, especially by young scientists, because we go to college, we get all the big degrees. We, you know, we, there's all the PhDs out there, which is awesome and great that they've learned that. And then they know they are the gods in white coats or whatever. And so they go and they use their science and they will prove all of these theories even more than they've already been proven. And so now we have more knowledge and science is marching forward. But that's not what science is for. The purpose of science is to collect data to teach us what we don't know, not to prove what we already think we know, so he, you know, um, his whole thing was to save wildlife in Africa uh, from the livestock because all these farmers, these peasants are running around destroying the land. And so he did all of these studies and the, the, the science showed, which, which this is what proved what they already knew, is that too many animals on the land will desertify the land. And he said, there's way too many animals on here. We we already removed the livestock. We already removed the peasants. So the people aren't destroying it. The livestock aren't destroying it because they're not there. So it's the great big giant herbivores. And he, he says, if you haven't watched his TED Talk, go watch it. But he said, it broke my heart because I, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I was trying to save the wildlife. And our science absolutely proved that we had to shoot 40,000 elephants to save the land. And he went back and he told his people that, and they said, we're not going to shoot 40,000 elephants. So they got a group of scientists and went out there. They verified that his findings were accurate. They had to lower the numbers and they did it. They shot 40,000 elephants. And guess what happened? The land desertified faster than ever. And, and this is where he, he said, okay, this is the biggest blunder of my entire life. I have destroyed all of these elephants, which is what we were trying to save. And now all the other ones are going to die because <laughs> there's nothing to eat. Because it's So what are we going to do? So he said, I devoted the rest of my life to figure this out. And he learned to stop using science to prove what we already think we know. And he learned to use the data and the science to figure out what we don't know. And now the work he's doing is like that, uh, like that picture. I'll just share my screen again real quick, and we'll just go back and look at that one more time. But there's dozens of pictures like this, hundreds of pictures like this around the world, where we have a problem of desertification, and if in a few short years, I mean this one's decades, but there are some that are uh, like short, like five six years. We're seeing major differences. And, and this can be done. And this is the number one thing that we teach in our 17-week course. How do you take a piece of land that is not producing and we make it produce? So anyway, we've had a good discussion tonight. Our time is up. Um, share this with your friends. The link will be out probably tomorrow on YouTube. Go plant trees. Oh.
<laughs> plant trees. Yeah, that's right. Plant <laughs> <Thank> trees. You. <laughs> you can get tree seedlings for free from like the Arbor Day Foundation. I don't know. They might cost a dollar a piece, but that's free. Especially for somebody who only needs 10 trees. What's $10 in today's world? But anyway. Okay. Um, good night, everyone. And have a fantastic week. We will do this again next week. Same time, same place, same link.